Listen. Short story long. Welcome. It could take your whole life. Preach. Develop clarity. Second, patience. If it scares you, you should probably do it. Whatever you think you don't have, you have something else in its place. Simon, welcome to the pod, man. Nice to be here. I'm very excited. Thank you. I want to say a couple things. I want to start you off with a couple compliments. First of all, we have a lot of cool people in this office, right? We have uh, we run a couple clothing lines out of here, a lot of rappers, athletes, whatever. You just, I don't know if you know it or not, but just walking down the hall, you just got a really big response from our staff. I did not know that. Yeah, they were in the offices. They saw you walk by. They were like, oh my God, is that Simon? <laughs> That's very so, nice. Just Thank so you. you know, you are like a... Uh, I've reached rapper and athlete status. You have, man. And, <laughs> and not even all the rappers and athletes get that, get that response. Um, the other thing is I have become a pretty avid reader. Um, I read about a book a week, and that's not bragging or even a goal of mine. That's just about where I've gotten to, which I'm proud of and never thought I'd be that guy. But I want to say I never – my whole childhood I never read. I don't remember them ever – forcing us to read books at the school that I went to. The first book I ever read front to back was Start With Why. And that was the Whoa. first book, that was the first time I had ever realized, this is gonna sound so stupid now, but that there was information in books that you can't get anywhere else it's that true. makes so much sense. It's true. And it was like, holy cow, man. Like This is something that I've thought was true and that I kind of had this little instinct for, but there's a whole book about why it's true and examples and you know what I mean? So I owe you, uh, I'm in debt to you forever well, for that. Well, that's very nice of you. Thank you yeah. very much. I appreciate that. Absolutely. So It was the first book I read too. <laughs> so, so the first thing that I want to do is I want to understand how you became this author, speaker th th that gets recognized walking down the hallway of apparel companies. I mean, did you set out to be this? How did this even happen? I know you didn't grow up in America. Can you give me a quick rundown of how you became you? <laughs> So I, I, I did spend the formative years of my life here. I moved to America when I was 10. Got it. So I, I spent a good, a good portion of my life here. Um, my journey, as you said, was not, was not the plan. Yeah. Um, um, and it has been entirely organic. Um, I worked in marketing. I worked at an ad agency. Yeah. I wanted to start my own business. I quit and started my own marketing firm at the tender age of 28 years old. Yeah. And... For any entrepreneur, you know, you have the statistic that hangs over your head that over 90% of all new businesses fail in the first three years, yeah. you know, sort of mid to high 90 percentile. Yeah. And so we made it through those three years, which is amazing and exciting. Yeah. And the fourth year after all of that sort of energy had gone, I sort of lost the passion for what I was doing. And I was very embarrassed because superficially my life was good. You know, yeah. I owned my own business, I made an okay living, we had great clients, we did great work, and yet I didn't want to wake up and go to work every day. Yeah. And so I kept it to myself. So all of my energy went into pretending that I was happier, more successful, and more in control than I felt. Yeah. And in reality, I was paranoid, and it was, it was a pretty dark time. And it wasn't until a friend of mine came to me and said, I'm worried about you, something's different, something's wrong. And it gave me a safe space to come clean. And I sort of blurted it all out how I really felt. And it was the most cathartic experience. And so all of that energy that went into lying, hiding, and faking every day, yeah. I now took that energy into finding a solution for why I felt this way. And there was a series of events that I'll spare you all the gory details. Um, but long story short, I discovered that there's this natural pattern that's based on the biology of human decision-making, yeah. that every single one of us knows what we do um, some of us know how we do it, the things that we think distinguish us or differentiate us from the people who do the same thing as we do. Yeah. Um, but very, very few people can clearly articulate why they do what they do, that purpose, cause, or belief that underlies it. Like, why do you get out of bed in the morning and why should anyone care? Um, and that's the piece that was missing for me. I knew what I did, I knew how I was different, but I couldn't tell you why I was doing it. And so I went on this journey to discover my why. Um, once my why was articulated, it sort of unleashed a passion that I probably have never experienced before. Everything made sense. Yeah. And um, I did something that everybody would do, which is I shared it with my friends. 
You read a great book, you see a good movie, you yeah. tell your friends to go see it or read it. Yeah. That's what we do, right? We want our friends to share in our joy. Yeah. And so I wanted my friends to share in my joy. And I told them about this thing called the why, and I helped them find their why. And some of them were, made crazy life changes and invited me to their homes to share it with their friends. And I literally would stand in people's living rooms and talk about the why and help people find their why for a hundred bucks on the side. And uh, people just kept inviting me and I just kept saying yes. And then they invited me to talk to their companies. They invited me to talk to their, you know, their, their entrepreneur groups or whatever. And yeah. I just kept saying yes. And, and it became a very wild ride very, very quickly. Gosh, that's how you know you're onto something like, right. You know what I mean? Like when you have this small idea and it just resonates with you and then all of a sudden it resonates with all these other people too. Like I think a lot of times like you have that idea and you're like, yeah, I think that's good. And for some reason, no one else thinks it's good. You know, but I feel like when you have that magic moment of something that resonates so deeply with you and then you're a couple of friends and then their friends and then a whole company and then... Um, I think that's, by the way, a big mistake that a lot of people make, especially when they go into 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 business for themselves is they try to figure out what everybody else wants. Yeah. They try and imagine or guess people are going to love this. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And we do it inside companies too. We design something that people are going to people are going to love this, yeah, you know? Course. And they don't. And sometimes you get it right, but it's a little more of a lottery. It's a little more like spinning the wheel and you think you're a genius when you hit. Yeah. But I'm not sure that's the truth. Um, I think in reality when we set out to solve our own problems or solve the problems for the people we love, that it's more likely to resonate with other people because turns out we're not that unique. Yeah. And other people have the same challenges and problems as we do. You know, I'm not the only person, I wasn't the only person who struggled with issues of passion and inspiration. Yeah. Turns out a lot of us would like to know that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I think those are the best companies. And if you look, if we look at our favorite companies, they were all born out of an individual or a small, small group of people who set out to just solve their own problem. Yeah. And that solution became the company. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And so the the where did you did you kind of stumble on the fact that you were lacking your why? Like as you were doing like soul searching, you kind of found it, and and it came from that place that well, you started researching and all that. No, stuff? No, no, I I I I was in the ad world, and I was mm -hmm. always curious why some marketing worked and some marketing didn't, why yeah. some advertising worked and some advertising didn't. Yeah. And so just as a young ad man, you know, I. I started looking at the stuff that worked and I knew it wasn't the agencies because good agencies produce bad work. Yeah. And I knew it wasn't the creative teams for the same reason. Yeah. And there had to be something else. And so I looked at all my favorite advertising and I noticed there was an order th to the information. Yeah. It started with some sort of why at the top and sort of it, it sort of went in that as opposed to stuff that started with the what at the top, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so I wrote down this pattern that I, even back then I called the golden circle and it was simply, honestly, just to describe uh, how marketing worked. Yeah. And it, I was at um, a black tie affair uh, and I sat next, you know, you get seated next to random people. And I sat next to someone whose dad used to be a neuroscientist or something like that at a university. And we just started talking and she started telling me about the limbic brain and the neocortex. And I thought it was interesting. And I went back home and started Googling it because it was just interesting. Yeah. And it turns out that the, the, the biology matched this little thing that I had on a shelf. Yeah. So I hadn't figured out why marketing worked. I'd figured out why people do what they do. Yeah. And that's when it sort of, I was like, dots yeah. started connecting and sparks started flying. And then, so that led to, like you said, the speaking, the bigger stuff, then like the, that was we'll start with why your first book. Mm -hmm. And did that naturally just become the progression after doing all this speaking and, you know, a book is kind of the obvious next no, thing? No, no, again, I, you know, understand that this was not my journey. This was not in the plan. Like I never wanted to be a public speaker. Yeah. You know, I like being behind the scenes. You know, I've always been a behind the scenes yeah, guy. So much for that. You know, yeah. Even <laughs> even now, some of the work that I do that I'm most proud of is behind the scenes. Yeah. You know, and um, uh, and so I never imagined I would be be in the front of the proscenium. But there you go. Yeah. And I never thought I'd be an author. I wasn't one of those people who thought I have a book in me. I just didn't never it just wasn't my thing. Yeah. You know, you're talking to the person who decided not to do. Uh, a thesis in college just because it seemed like so much writing, yeah, you know, yeah. like who wants to write a hundred pages, yeah. you know? Here you are, what, five books oh, later? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. And uh, um, and it, somebody else, it was a friend of mine who said, you have to write this down, you have to write a book. Yeah. I And I had already been giving the talk for two years and I shrugged my shoulders and said, oh, okay. And uh, I managed to get a meeting. So this is the thing, I used to talk about the why all the time. 
It's, I was, it's an obsession. And so when you talk about what you believe, so people go, there's someone you need to meet. Yeah. And, and so this is what happened. I would talk about my why and my friend goes, there's someone you need to meet. Yeah. And I got introduced to this editor and I told him my why and he goes, there's someone you need to meet. Yeah. And he introduces me to a publisher who happens to be the god of business publishing. He was, he was the original publisher from good to great, yeah. you know? And I go in and I have a 29 minute meeting with him. He has to leave for something. Three days later, uh, I get a call and they offer me a book deal. Wow. So, and, and that's sort of what happened. Every time I talked about what I believed, people who believed what I believed said, yeah. there's someone you need to meet. Yeah. And so, so my career started to move fast, not because of me, I was the same idiot yeah. as I was <laughs> two weeks ago. Yeah. The only difference was I stopped talking about what I do and started talking about what I believe. Yeah. And people kept, kept connecting me with people who believed what I believed, which means we got along. Yeah. So, uh, so that, and, and, it, and like I said, it really, I, and I, and I, once I realized that this thing worked, I made the decision to turn myself into the guinea pig. I wanted, I, I like the scientific method. I like testing things until they fail. Yeah. Developing a theory, testing it, it fails, you know, tweak the theory. Yeah. And so I closed my marketing business. All my friends thought something was wrong that I'd gone bankrupt or something which hadn't happened. I'd never been more confident in my life. Yeah. And I started all by myself again and started from scratch and didn't know exactly what form it was going to take. I thought, would I be a consultant? Was I, you know, I didn't know. Yeah. But I, I, was, I, was on, I was up for the journey. Yeah. All I knew was this idea resonated and I wanted to spread it. Yeah. And I got the opportunity to write the book. Um, and uh, the book and the TEDx talk actually ha came out the exact same month by total coincidence. Jeez. So people think that like one got the other one. It didn't happen that way. Yeah. Uh, the, but the publisher had no idea that I had a TEDx talk because it had never been booked when I got the book deal. Yeah. And the TEDx, it, they, they were completely unrelated. Yeah. It was just sheer coincidence. They came out the same month. Um, and that quickly became the most watched TEDx talk of all time on YouTube because yeah. they didn't put them on TED.com yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it just, again, the, the idea started to spread. And, and more and more I became sort of, I, beca I recognized that I... I would be I would be proud to carry this message, and it would it would be something that I would commit myself to. But after I wrote Start with Why, I thought I was done book writing. Yeah, that wasn't the case. Look, I, you know what I love too is like I'm sure, obviously, a lot of authors are probably you know deeply passionate and living examples of what they write about. But you, with this Why concept, I mean, you are the epitome of of what it is and what it stands for. I love that. I didn't. I guess I knew that from reading the books, but not to the extent that you just explained it, you know, mm -hmm. where it was a complete life change and not even sort of, it almost seems like your why took you in a direction that you didn't even think you wanted to go. And, but now I'm guessing you're incredibly happy, very successful. Um, it sort of led you. That's really interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah. It continues to lead me. Cause most um, people think about it. Like I'm going to start a business we're going to make money. I'm going to lead the business. I'm going to say where everything goes. But it's interesting how with businesses and with people, this idea of having a really strong why and what you're about can almost lead you. Well, I don't think of myself as the leader. I think of myself as a follower. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I am in service to an idea that's bigger than me. Yeah. You know, I have a vision of a world that does not yet exist, a world in which the vast majority of us wake up every single morning inspired, feel safe at work. Yeah and return home fulfilled at the end of the day. Yep. And I am simply a piece of the jigsaw puzzle and I will do my job and I'll, I will lay down my piece. And part of my, my piece of the puzzle is, you know, when you do a jigsaw puzzle, the first thing you do is you lean the box against the wall so you can see the picture. <laughs> yeah. My job is to point to the picture, Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. Part of my job, part of my responsibility is to remind everybody where we're going. Yeah. And it serves as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a lighthouse for me also. It serves as a compass for me as well. And so, um, you know, we don't have conversations at the company, at the, the business about what's good for the business. Yeah. It, that just doesn't happen. We have conversations about what's good for the movement. Yeah. And sometimes it's very in, much in the interest of the company. And sometimes we're willing to make sacrifices because it's the right thing to do to advance the business. Yeah. And no matter how much stuff I get done or whatever I achieve, I've been talking about this since the first day. And like the first time I articulated the why, people said, this is amazing. And I said, tip of the iceberg. Yeah. And then the TED Talk came out and it started to go viral. And people said, that's amazing. And I said, tip of the iceberg. Yeah. And now 13 years later, people go, it's amazing. And I go, 
tip of the iceberg. <laughs> yeah. Because the vision is underwater. Yeah. There's so, so much more of the iceberg that we cannot see, that doesn't exist yet. It's not in reality. It's only in my imagination. It's only in our imagination of the yeah. world we could live in. Yeah. And all of the successes that I am able to achieve or that, that people who believe what I believe achieve also, the great companies that, that are, are, serve as great examples of what the world could look like, you know? Um, all it does is reveal more of the iceberg. So the people who, who doubted us at the beginning when it was literally just an, a figment of our imaginations, yeah. they can see tangible results and they go, I can see it now. Yeah. I w okay, I'll, I'll work with you because I see what you're trying to build. Yeah. And so the more success we have just means more people will join us. Yeah. But, but um, I, I've, you know, I, whenever I finish a book or whenever I, something happens, I'm always like, okay, on to the next because all that happened is just a little more iceberg is showing, but yeah. there's all that iceberg underneath. Yeah. So the fun is trying to figure out how to show more of the iceberg. Yeah. That's the challenge. But, but, I, but like I said, I am not, I don't, live, I don't live in the joy, well, that's not the right way to put it. I don't bask in how much uh, 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 of the iceberg I've been able to show. Yeah. I live in service of how much more there is to get out, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that's what I love. So for the listener, I mean, the iceberg is essentially your, what you describe in the new book as your just cause, right? Yeah, correct. Um, or your why, can that also count? I mean, uh, uh, they're different. Okay. A why, um, it comes from the past. Yeah. A why is ostensibly an origin story. Okay. It's where you come from. It's why the company was started. Yeah. Right? Um, every single individual has a why. Mm -hmm. We all have one and we have only one. Yeah. It is fully formed by the time we're probably in our mid to late teens and it never changes for the rest of our life. Yeah. The rest of our lives simply offer us an opportunity to live in balance with our why, yeah. right? A just cause is a vision of the future. Yeah. So where the why comes from the past yeah. and it is objective and fixed, yeah. a just cause is about the future and you can pick anyone you want and it's totally malleable. Yeah. Right, it's. But shouldn't they be kind of in line? Yeah, for sure. absolutely, yeah, okay, okay. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, that's when you know that you have passion for your just cause because it's actually born out of your why. So think of it like the foundation of a house. Yeah. Your why is the foundation of the of the house. It's the origin. It's that's the that's the foundation. Yeah. It's not going to change. Yeah. But you have a vision of the house you want to build. That's the just cause, mm -hmm. and you might make some tweaks along the way. But it's basically going to have the shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's the better way to think about yeah. it. Yeah. So th was what you just described where people wake up every day, inspire... That's the just it? cause. Okay. That's the future. That's where we're going. And what's your why? My why is to inspire people to, to do the things that inspire them. Yeah. So together, each of us can change our world for the better. Yeah. And so the just cause is I've been able to now say more specifically what that is. Yeah. But where I come from is about inspiring people. Okay. That's the foundation upon which the just cause is built. Yeah. So the iceberg is the just cause. And the way that you explain it in the book is... You may, I mean, you probably should set out to never reveal the whole iceberg, right? No, it's not that you, it, that's not a choice. It's that the iceberg can never be fully revealed. Okay. It's infinite. Yeah, better right? put. Yeah. So what I'm saying is like, I think that this book is so interesting because it's essentially, we're going to get into more of it because I'm going to try to pack a lot of it into this one little sentence, but like, it's essentially that we look at the game of life or building companies or that stuff mm -hmm. wrong. And... So this concept of having a goal, it's not even a goal. Having a just cause, having it's a, not a purpose goal. That's for the problem. why you We use the wrong words. Yeah, we use yeah. the wrong words. See, I'm already so, tripped up. I know. It, takes <laughs> it does take practice. Yeah. And, and, the, and you, know, you have your little poster over there that says mindset is everything. Yeah. You know, uh, we have to learn to change the words away from a finite mindset towards an infinite mindset. Let, let's, uh, let's share with your listeners what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, so in 1986, James Carse, a professor of theology at NYU, wrote a little book called Finite and Infinite Games. And in that, he defined these two types of games. He said, if you have at least one competitor, a game exists. And there are two types of games. A finite game, which is defined as known players, fixed rules, and an agreed upon objective. Yeah. Baseball. We all agree what the rules are. We all agree to play by the rules. And we all agree that whoever has more runs at the end of the game will be declared the winner. There will be a winner and there will be a loser. Yeah. And in finite games, there is always a beginning, a middle, and an end, mm -hmm. right? Then you have an infinite game. And an infinite game is defined as known and unknown players. Yeah. Um, the rules are changeable and you can play however you want. 
And the objective is to s perpetuate the game, to stay in the game as long as possible. Yeah. There is no end. So, for example, um, things like education is an infinite game. You can't win education. Yeah. You can come number one in school, but that doesn't mean you've won education. Your education lasts your lifetime. Yeah. You know, there's no such thing as winning global politics. Yeah. You can't be number one in marriage. And there's definitely no such thing as winning business. Yeah. But we talk about all of them as if there is. Bingo. And that's the problem, which is you listen to too many people and they talk about being number one, being the best and beating their competition. Yeah. Based on what? There's no agreed upon rules, there's no agreed upon uh, metrics, and there's no agreed upon timeframes. And what I love that you, that you point out in there is like, so I could say, well, yeah, Simon, um, the goal is I'm gonna have more revenue at the end of 2019 than this company, because they are my competitor. So not only number one is the game much bigger than that, but let's just say I beat it. Then what do I do on January of 2020? Just set a different one? Yeah. And then all your employees are like, what the hell are you doing? And so I, that's where it becomes it really... a rat race. It just becomes a hamster yeah. wheel of, of keep new goals, new goals, new goals, new goals. And at the end of it, and I see this with senior people more than junior people, because yeah. junior people have the excitement. They have a new job. They got a new this. I just got my first promotion. I just got my first bonus. I just won my first piece of business. Yeah. It, it, you know, there's a lot of novelty and excitement when we're young in our careers and we're moving our way up the chain and oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. And then I start to see more more, more senior people actually who have played that game yeah. and they've been in that rat race and they've hit all the goals and they've beat all the targets and they've got their promotions and they're doing it again and again and again and again yeah. and they start asking themselves when does the joy happen yeah. like when do I start to feel really fulfilled by this career because I'm doing everything I've been told to do I've made money I've advanced up the ranks and yet how come I don't feel intense joy. I feel happiness m momentarily, yeah. like when we win the client or meet the numbers, yeah. I feel happy, but that feeling goes away. When do I get joy and fulfillment that everybody keeps telling me I can get in my career? Yeah. Um, and, and this is because we have the wrong mindset for the game we're in. We're, we're playing to win in a game that has no end. And when you talk about we beat the competition, yeah, but you chose the time frame yeah. and you chose the metric. Yeah. We beat them in revenues by the end, by the end of 19, 2019. Yeah, but you have no profit. Yeah. Yeah. They're super profitable, yeah. even though they have lower revenues than you. Yeah. And you'll go out of business in three years, even though you were celebrating in 2019. And by the way, they were ignoring you yeah. and they've gone on to last for 40, 50, 60, 100, and 200 years yeah. and remain profitable ever since. Yeah. And this is the problem, which is we, we, we're, we're arbitrarily setting out to beat, we chose who we want to beat. Yeah. Like, who cares? Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, 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 and we become obsessed with winning in a game that cannot be won. Yeah. And that to me is hilarious. And and all of this language that we, we overuse sports metaphors. Yeah. If another CEO comes, starts giving me a sports metaphor about how, he, yeah. how, how they run their business, yeah. I'm like, finite mindset. Yeah. Sports has a beginning, middle and end. Goals, you say, well, the goal, of beginning, middle and end. Yeah. And so though you can win a finite game, that you can hit a goal in the infinite game, it's about advancing something, not about achieving something. There are achievements within. Yeah. Of course, there are finite games within the infinite game. Yeah. We're still driven by tangible numbers. We're still driven to meet goals. That's innate in human beings. Yeah. But the question is, to what end? So I'm hitting this goal to advance what? Yeah. So the infinite game is the context within which all the other finite games should exist. And so every win we achieve is in order to advance something bigger than ourselves. So we never achieve a just cause, we advance towards a just cause. That's the iceberg. Yep. And the reason I feel successful more now than I did 13 years ago is because I've revealed more of the iceberg. Yep. So I'm advancing the revealing of the iceberg. Yeah. Yeah. But, I, but there's not like, I'm gonna show 10 feet of it and then I'm done. Yeah. Well. There's so much more to do. I get it. And so it's, it's very fulfilling. It's not like, oh, but you always have more work to do. I know, but that's the joy. Yeah. The joy is, is that it never goes away. And that's the idea. You talk about it a little bit, but the idea that um, that's what leaves a company or an idea for someone else to pick up after you're gone. Of course. And that's how you live forever. Of course. Right? So of it's course. much more fulfilling in that aspect. So many companies are basically driven by force of personalities. Yeah. You know, yeah. and when those personalities, even if they're remarkable and inspiring and wonderful, yeah. once they leave, either the business completely collapses or it goes sideways. And we see this with very large companies. Yeah. We saw Walmart go sideways. Mm -hmm. We saw Microsoft go sideways. We saw all of these companies go sideways 
because the vision and inspiration left and the obsession with winning Disney went sideways. You know, the, the obsession with winning and being number one and dominating the globe is what occupied the new CEO. Yeah. And we hated them. Yeah. We didn't want to work for them. We and didn't want I, to buy from them. What I love that you can point out is you can almost say, well, you can say, here's companies like Walmart and Disney who had very strong sort of just causes. At the beginning. Yes. Then you see where the original founder or original CEO is gone. Mm -hmm. You can see where a person who was driven by this money is making came me very in. insecure, by the way. <laughs> That's good for video. <laughs> then you can see, I need to make sure, from now on, all of our water bottles got to match in size. His uh, is huge and mine is tiny. <laughs> I have like um, the miniest mini little water bottle. You gave him bottle. a shot of this water is like a, this, is like, Look this is like a Barbie water bottle you gave me. <laughs> okay, so, so you can see where this guy leaves, a CEO driven by money comes in, and then you can also see where somebody comes back back in who seems to get the original just cause and kind yes. of turns things around. Yes. That to me is fascinating. Yes. Because I think it's easy to say, well, yeah, this guy was the founder. Of course he had all this passion. This guy's driven by money. It tanked. Happened. But to see someone come back Correct. in and properly translate the just cause again and show the effect that it has yeah. on the business is incredible. Yeah. And, and we... You know, Steve Jobs came back to his own company to restore it. Michael yeah. Dell came back to his own company to restore it. Howard Schultz came back to Starbucks to restore it. Yeah. Um, Doug McMillan has come back, or he's still there, but he got promoted to CEO at Walmart and has restored the just cause. Satya Nardala has uh, taken over as CEO of Microsoft. Yeah. He's put the just yeah. cause front and center. Yeah. And all of a sudden we like companies like Walmart again. And all of a sudden we, the top talent wants to go work for Microsoft again. Yeah. Um, you know, and they were lucky that they had a lot of money because the money provided them runway, yeah. just like a startup, yeah. but eventually money does run out. Yeah. Um, and so if you, if you don't get back to that infinite drive again, then, then eventually the company will go bankrupt or, or just get acquired by someone else. Yeah. And it basically will cease to exist. And you even talk about the difference of the way you think about the profit that the company makes. If, when you think about that as a... Uh, as fuel to fuel the just cause and yeah. growing bigger with a bigger purpose, it you it makes everyone so much more motivated and makes you want to make more money as opposed to just we're making it for the sake of making Correct. it. Correct. Money money is not a purpose. Money yeah. is a result. Yeah. And of course, money is important in a, in 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 a infinite organization yeah. because you have to perpetuate the game and you need resources. But there's two there's two currencies in the infinite game which is will and resources. You know, in a finite game, for most businesses, it's only about the money. They know that the people thing is important, yeah. but the money is the thing. The money is the metric. Yeah. And in the infinite game, it's will and resources. And will comes before resources. Because um, f resources, i.e. money, yeah. is finite. I mean, you can run out of it. Where will, the, the, it's infinite. Yeah. Like the will of people. And in hard times, um, it's, it's the will of the people that will save you. Yeah. If the people all abandon ship, the company's done, no matter, even if you were rich. Yeah. We've seen it happen multiple times, yeah. right? We saw it happen with Enron. We saw it happen with Lehman Brothers. We've seen it happen. We've seen it happen multiple times that rich companies can disappear. Yeah. And we've seen employees take pay cuts to advance. Bingo. And when the will is strong, we've seen people sacrifice yeah. their own interests because they care so much about keeping the company alive. They do not abandon ship. And this is so important, yeah. which is it's, it's the will of the people that is, uh, is is a is is the priority in inside great organizations yeah. and the will of the people is what fuels the provides the resources and as you said we we have we change our mindset as to how we view money money is no longer the goal yeah. money becomes the fuel and if you think about the company as a car and the just cause is the is the is the destination the iceberg that you're trying to reveal yeah. so you need money you need fuel to get to where you're going yeah. so you can have the most wonderful culture that doesn't leave the driveway yeah. well that's no good either so it's the, the will of the people to, 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 to go on the journey and the fuel to, to, to make, the, to make the, the car go. Yeah, it's fascinating. Why do, you think, why do you think that we don't get this? Do you think it's just easier to think about it in sports metaphors and that's how we're kind of always well, it, taught? And... I mean, human beings are very tangibly driven animals. You mm -hmm. know, what, what, it, what motivates us is the ability to, to, to see things and count things. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you say you will get a bonus if you hit this target by this date, I'm golden, man. I can freaking drive towards that and, and I'll hit that target. Yeah. But if I say to you, you'll get a bonus if you accomplish more, you're going to be like, 
well, uh, how, how much more? Yeah. I'd be like, more. Yeah. Uh, it's unnerving. Yeah. And so we're very tangibly driven animals. I mean, it goes back to caveman times. Yeah. You know, we need to see the thing we want to get and we go after the thing we want to get. And the, mat- the metrics help us, help us feel like we're getting closer. But, but that doesn't fulfill these, these deep-seated desires to, for psychological safety or to feel a part of something bigger than ourselves, to, to feel some sort of belonging to a tribe. Yeah. Um, that, that doesn't fulfill those, those deep-seated human needs. Yeah. And so there, ha- there is more than simply you know, killing the gazelle yeah. and eating and building the house yeah. and making more money. There's more. And, and it's a human being thing. Yeah. You know? and, so, and so it's not... It's, we, we default to the things that are easier to count. It's much easier to count money than inspiration. Yeah. You know, you, you know, it's, it's, it's people, you know, people who say that these things don't exist, it's not that they don't exist and they're not, it's not the universe trying to provide for anything. It's just that they're hard to measure. Like, how do you, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk talks about this, which is what's the ROI of your mother? Yeah. You know, like, do you know your mother loves you? Yes. Yeah. Prove it. Yeah. You know, like what's, and I don't mean like she made me lunch. I mean, like, show me the numbers, show me the metrics. Yeah. Like, show me the numbers to prove to me that your girlfriend or boyfriend love you. Yeah. You don't have one. It's a feeling. Yeah. Trust is a feeling. Love is a feeling. It doesn't mean they don't exist. Yeah. It just means they're hard to put into numbers. Yeah. But over time, they're very easy to put into numbers because over time, the traditional metrics actually benefit from things like trust and love. Yeah. So a, a family and a couple that love each other will probably have more successful kids and be more successful themselves because they have a support structure. A company where there's lots of trust over time will outperform all companies yeah. because, because it matters. So over time, the traditional metrics are very handy, yeah. but it's much harder to measure in those discrete packets. Yeah. Um, and the irony is some of it is actually very easy uh, to recognize, if not measure. Like, you know, in, in, in so many of our modern businesses, we, we think uh, performance is the thing. Yeah. I'll tell you a funny story. It's, it's one of the stories in the book that you may remember. Yeah. Um, so I, I had the opportunity to visit with Navy SEALs, yeah. right? Love that part. And I met the director of training. Um, and I asked him a very simple question. How do you choose? Right? It's not yeah. like, how do you choose? Yeah. You know? And um, they said that um, they look at two criteria. They look at performance and trust. Yeah. And the way they define those terms is performance is how you perform on the battlefield. Trust is what kind of person you are off the battlefield. So the, the way they put it is, I may trust you with my life, but do I trust you with my money or my wife? Yeah. Right? They're seals. So, so just because someone's good at their job doesn't mean we want to spend time with them on a weekend. Yeah. Right? How do you measure that? So, so what they do is they look at those two axes and clearly nobody wants the low performer of low trust. Mm-hmm. Clearly, everybody wants the high performer of high trust, obviously. What they discovered is that the high performer of low trust is a toxic team member. And they would actually rather have a medium performer of high trust, sometimes even a low performer of high trust, it's a relative scale, over the high performer of low trust. Now, if you think about it in business, we have a million metrics to measure someone's performance and minimal to no metrics to measure someone's trustworthiness. And And I would argue that a lot of high performing low trust people are getting promotions of course. and thriving in business. Of course, and, and what it does, it sends a message to the rest of the organization, yeah. which is we don't care how you hit your numbers. As long as you hit your numbers, you will do very well here. Yeah. So we actually accidentally incentivize dishonest and unethical behavior. Yeah. We actually incentivize people to hoard information instead of share it and stab each other in the back instead of help each other grow, yeah. right? Not on purpose, right? Um, and the irony is that it's so easy to, defi- to find those toxic geniuses. Yeah which is simply go to any team, yeah. ask them who the asshole is, and they'll all point to the same person, Yeah. right? And equally, if you go to that same team and say, who always has your back when the chips are down, you know they'll always be there for you, they will also all point to the same person, yeah. who's probably your most gifted natural leader who actually helps the whole team's performance rise, yeah. but they may not be your best individual performer. Yeah. And so what we're doing is promoting the toxic asshole while ignoring the, the, the leader who's actually helping the team grow as a whole. And, and, and a lot of CEOs are chicken. Sometimes they even know who the toxic geniuses are. Yeah. And you bring it up to them. You say, that person is destroying your culture. They, and they go, I know, but they're, 
Their numbers are so good. Know, yeah, yeah. Right? Now, yeah. I don't, for one, believe that you automatically fire a high performer of low trust. I believe you coach them. Because we don't know, maybe it's the incentive structure, maybe we don't know that they didn't learn it, maybe they had bad examples. You coach them. Same with a low performer, even of high trust. Yeah. You still need people to perform, but you don't immediately fire someone because their performance is down. You coach them. Yeah. The only time you fire somebody is when somebody proves to be uncoachable. Yeah. When they say, I think I know what I'm doing. You don't need to tell me. And they're blind or deaf yeah. to any feedback yeah. and resistant to any feedback. Yeah. Then, then, there's, then as, as, uh, as Gary Ridge, the, C the CEO of WD40 likes to say, he says, we will happily make you available to the competition. You know? <laughs> I like that. That's a good way to put yeah. it. So this, this might sound a little <laughs> dramatic here, but when I was reading this book, you, so everything that you just talked about, essentially the idea of promoting the high performance asshole feels kind of like what we do in this country. You don't say. <laughs> and it felt when I read this book, like, gosh, man, this is a, we're in a crisis of finite mindset. It's, it's worse than that. Yes, we are in a crisis of finite mindset. And the, and the problem is because America is so rich as a nation yeah. that a lot of other developing nations follow our lead. So it's so they're they're seeing how we build our corporate cultures and promote our people, and they're saying, well, if it works for them, right? And so in the finite, it does. Yeah. Uh, but it it comes with a host of infinite problems, which is kind of like it's so nice to eat chocolate cake. I love having chocolate cake; it mm -hmm. makes me feel so good after every meal. Yeah. I cannot foresee that in ten years I'm getting diabetes and dying young. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what we're doing to our nation, yeah. which is we are leading with a finite mindset. We're building our businesses with a finite mindset because it tastes so sweet. Yeah. And we're literally ignoring the fact that we're giving ourselves diabetes. And this is, this is what is, uh, and the di we're starting to see the evidence of the diabetes right now, yeah. right? Which is too many of us, there's this uncomfortable feeling at work that our company and our bosses just don't care about us. Yeah. That we're just line items. You that's know? how you feel. I mean, that's how a lot of people feel as a citizen of. Yeah. You know what I'm and, saying? And we feel that our government doesn't really care about us. They yeah. really care about themselves. Yeah. Uh, you know, our politicians are way more interested in getting themselves reelected mm -hmm. than they are in sacrificing their jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, and here's the joke. If, if a politician, if a congressman or a senator loses their job, like miss, loses their election, mm -hmm. they're probably going to become a high-powered lobbyist or lawyer somewhere yeah. and make more money than, than they've ever dreamed of. So what exactly do they lose is my question, yeah. right? Yeah. It's just they, they like the power, I guess. I don't know. But... Yeah. And, and so, and so, but this is not, this is what didn't happen overnight. We can see, we can actually look back historically and see when we started eating more chocolate cake. Yeah. And uh, it goes back to the 1970s um, where an economist named Milton Friedman yeah. theorized, theorized a new responsibility for business. Like what is the, what is the responsibility of business? Mm -hmm. And he, his definition of the responsibility of business is that the responsibility of business is to maximize profit within the bounds of the law. It's a pretty low standard, right? It's like whenever, whenever companies do really, really unethical things, yeah. like when a pharmaceutical company raises the price of an essential drug, yeah. seven, eight hundred, a thousand times the original price, yeah. they, they get dragged in front of Congress and they always say the same thing, we didn't break the law. We, we, we follow. Yes, I know you didn't break the law. It's still freaking unethical, you piece of shit. Yeah. You know? Um, like, and this is what I mean. Like, it feels gross. Yeah. And we say, but that's wrong. And, but the company says, but we didn't do anything wrong because they're only talking about the law, right? Yeah. So this little definition, the responsibility of business is to maximize profit within the bounds of the law, was really appealing to a lot of people. You think that little, that yeah. moment made that sure. big of a Jeez. Sure, but it didn't happen overnight. It did not happen what overnight. A dick that guy is. Somebody, somebody, bas basically, what he said is, "Hey guys, check out this chocolate cake that I made." Yeah. Right. And he started to talk about things like um, the owners of companies are the shareholders, and we work for, and, and executives work for their owners. Yeah. Hmm. Not really. That's yeah. not really. Shareholders are more like renters yeah. than owners. And if you think about how we treat a rental car versus how we treat our own car, and now you see how shareholders treat companies, yeah. which is I only care about where I'm going. I don't actually care about the vehicle. Yeah. I don't actually care about your company. I only care, do I get out what I want, yeah. right? So we, we lots of flawed assumptions here. Yeah. But, the, but the business community, especially shareholder community, went, we love that. 
And so they started changing incentive structures to incentivize uh, uh, executives not based on the performance of the company and how they treat the employees and customers. Now it's all about the, the return to shareholder, yeah. right? And so you started to see these new kinds of business theories and practices started to develop and really flourish in the 80s and 90s. And you have to remember the 80s and 90s were boom years. Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, pick your politics, it doesn't matter. Everybody's happy, everybody's rich, yeah. blah, 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 world peace, life's good. Yeah. You know, it's a real, pretty pretty decent time. Sure, there was the Cold War, but it's not like it was in the 50s, yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Like we weren't doing fire drills to hide under our desks because of nuclear war, yeah. right? It was a pretty good time. And so all in the name of, of profit, you started to see new things like um, mass layoffs. The idea of using mass layoffs on an annualized basis to balance the books did not exist in the United States prior to the 1980s. Did not exist. It was a new idea that gained popularity in the 80s yeah. and 90s. And now to this day, either we have been laid off or we have we, we one degree of separation. Every single one of us knows someone who was laid off by no fault of their own, yeah. simply because the company missed their arbitrary projections. Yeah. Think about that for a second. The company is profitable just not as profitable as it arbitrarily decided it wanted to be. Yeah. So to make sure that it balances the books, they're going to take your livelihood and your ability to provide for your family and send you home, yeah. right? That is wrong, ethically, not illegal, yeah. right? And we started to see systems like Rank and Yank, where you, you top grade the people, you rank all of the people's performance and you you promote the top 10% of performance, performance and fire the bottom 10%. Yeah. Well, as we just talked about with toxic geniuses, we're literally eviscerating some of the, the real talent inside our organizations that hold the culture together and we're promoting bastards, yeah. right? And then you start to see, uh, you start to see uh, timeframes become shorter and shorter and shorter because finite mindsets, people who operate with a finite mindset do not like surprises. Yeah. They like to exert control um, and they do not like uncertainty. So if we make the time frames really short, we can exert a lot of control over performance yeah. in a quarter. Five years, 10 years, very difficult. An infinite mindset embraces uncertainty, embraces surprises, yeah. sees opportunity in, in, in surprises, yeah. right? So you see all this finite mindset, all this chocolate cake we're consuming and everybody's getting rich and the top 1% are getting richer and richer and richer. And we saw the average CEO's uh, pay uh, increase uh, 70 times, 75 times more than the stock market. Yeah. We saw the average CEO's pay go from uh, 30 times the average employee to something like 250 times the average employee, yeah. you know, where the average employee saw their pay go, grow, raise 11%, yeah. right? It just became twisted. And where you have mass separation, you have discontent. Yeah. So we see a rise of a populist of a populist message. And I don't care what your politics are. Yeah. You know, go to the last election. If, if, if you were on the left, it was Bernie Sanders. And if you were on the right, it was Donald Trump, yeah. right? But both of them were preaching a populist message. Yeah. And we're seeing people rebel against capitalism. Capitalism is not the problem. Yeah. It's the Milton Friedman, 1980s and 90s, Reagan Clinton version of capitalism. Yeah. It's this modern form of diabetes capitalism that we have now, where we consume ourselves with chocolate cake, yep. right? Without any sense of responsibility. That's the capitalism we have. It's not real capitalism. It's not the capitalism that Adam Smith envisioned over 200 years ago. It's not the capitalism that made America what it is today. That capitalism puts the human being fir first and foremost. It prioritizes the health of the customer. Yep. It insists that you look after the employee. It is, it is a, is a, it is a production minded, uh, uh, it is consumption minded rather than production minded, right? Um, and we've abandoned real capitalism. Capitalism is a very wonderful, good system, but this modern form of capitalism that we have has been completely twisted. So when people like me speak up, yeah. I'm accused of being naive. Yeah. I'm told I don't understand how business works and I'm told that I'm anti-capitalist. And I always say, well, Let's beware the messenger. Yeah. Who are the people who are criticizing me and calling me naive and anti-capitalist? Oh, it's the people who are benefiting most from the status quo, yeah. of course, yeah. right? It is a very, very, very small percentage of people who benefit from this bastardized form of capitalism yeah. 
that are quick to criticize the rest of us. And yet the rest of us are the ones going to work and they're profiting off of our blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah. And we feel really uncomfortable. Now, we have no problem with our leaders making more money than us. That's no problem. Yeah. We don't, nobody has a problem with somebody more senior making more money. Yeah. I, you know, it doesn't morally offend us no. as long as they are willing to take care of us. Yeah. It's tribal. And yet too many of us, dare I say the vast majority of us, right, go to work, not really feeling safe, not really feeling like we could be trusted or that we trust our leaders. You know, it's just, we, the company makes decisions that, you know, we go along with them, but it's uncomfortable. I can't really put my finger on it. Yeah. Sometimes we know we do things that are wrong, but we shrug our shoulders and we rationalize and we say, hey man, I got to put food on the table. Yeah. You know, it's what my boss wants. Look, everyone's doing it. Hey man, it's the system, yeah. right? It's just how it works. And the rationalizations we tell ourselves to deal with the discomfort. But I say, instead of trying to just, you know, numb the discomfort, let's take a look at the root of the discomfort. And it turns out we have broken our very, very good system of capitalism and we need to repair it. We need to pull back on the chocolate cake and eat a few more vegetables. Yeah. Sure, they don't taste as good, but they make you live longer yeah. and they make you happier and they make you sleep better yeah. and they make your friends like you more and they make you feel safe and good and in shape and confident. And isn't that what we all want at the end of the day? Yeah. So I'm a massive capitalist, just not this form of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I want, I want, uh, I want us to reverse a lot of the the Milton Friedman influence. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I couldn't believe when I read the book that that just way of looking at it, the Milton Friedman way caused that big of a yeah. But, but chain it, reaction. again, it didn't. It didn't. You know, there's a lot of movements that start course, with, start course. with a person with an idea. Of course, and they gain. They gain acceptance and they gain popularity and people take that thing and make it their own. Of Civil rights, you know, Martin Luther King may have had the dream, but it became our dream. Yeah. And we continued without him. Yeah. You know, well, Milton Friedman may have written an article, but a bunch of other people went, that. I know, I know. You know? That's the problem. So It's like there's the version of that that you talk about when you started talking about your why, and yeah. then there's that version where like the sharks are yeah. like that And it took 20 work. or 30 years for us to get to where we are. Yeah. And it's going to take us 20 or 30 years to get to where we need to go. Yeah. And I'm okay with that. You know, this is, and, and by the way, our movement, what you and I are discussing, and the people who are listening and nodding their heads, we will last longer than every politician and every CEO. Yeah. Because our job is not to win and our job is not to beat them. Our job is to keep the game in play and outlast. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Exactly. And so we, we will play with an infinite mindset. And yes, there will be days of frustration. And yes, there will be days of anger. And yes, there will be days of intense happiness and feelings of success and winning but we have to stay the course. This is a long journey. Like I said, it took 20 or 30 years to get us to where we are today, yeah. at least 30 years. Yeah. It's gonna take at least 30 years for us to reverse it, but there's an appetite for it. Yeah. I would not have been able to, you and I would not be able to have had this conversation in the 1980s, no. even in the 1990s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd have been, we'd, no one would be listening to this podcast. We would have been laughed. Yeah. No one would have bought a book or watched a talk. We would have been laughed at yeah. how clueless we were. There's an appetite for it. Yeah. And the reason there's an appetite for it is because it, people know it's uncomfortable. Yeah. And we don't necessarily know what it is. We just want the discomfort to go away. Yeah. And so we talk obsessively about work-life balance. Yeah. You know, you, no amount of yoga is going to fix that feeling. Damn it, Simon. Right? Work, yoga, mindfulness yeah. will not fix your feeling of work-life imbalance. Yeah. The problem is you feel safe at home and you don't feel safe at work. Yeah. Until we fix the capitalism that we're living in yeah. so that it's true capitalism, not bastardized false capitalism, yeah. right? Uh, that feeling will never go away. I'll tell you what, if we fix it, it's bad news for yoga. <laughs> <laughs> business is going down. There's you a know, lot of people trying to find But even find yoga has become a business, hasn't it? I was like, <laughs> That's what I'm saying though. Know, There's a lot of, I think a lot of the customers are driven by that lack of like, what am I even? Of course. Where's my thing? Of course, like so many things. Yeah. Like so many things. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's why, once again, I, 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 the reason why start with why At least it's healthier than drinking. <laughs> it's true. That's another way to escape. That's another that. way to numb, yeah. to numb the pain. But I don't know if you find as much purpose in there. Um, it lasts longer than an hour long yoga session though. <laughs> I, um, that feeling, the feeling I just sort of, that drove that question about the country and the state of things as a whole is, yeah. is why when I read start with why, and now the new book, uh, infinite game, I, I've, I felt this bigger, 
you know, a lot of people can look at those, I think, and be like, oh, that's for like if you're a business guy mm -hmm. or you're an entrepreneur mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's so much in both of these things. Mm -hmm. I think even more so than the country or polit in a political sense, I think there's a general just crisis of purpose mm -hmm. across the whole, you know, it ties into what we just talked about. But I think people, you know, people aren't as religious anymore. Um, and I'm not fighting for that. I'm just saying, I think across the board, there's this lack of what the hell is my mission even here? Yeah, I mean, I joke that I write philosophy books cleverly disguised as business books. Yeah, I think you, know? you do. And and for simple reason, because who wants to read a philosophy book, yeah. you know? Yeah, big um, time. Um, and because I, I'm not, I don't rage against the machine. Well, I guess I did just rage against the machine. Yeah, you did, literally. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> literally, literally, I raged against the machine, yeah. Um, you know, m during the Great Depression, unemployment reached 25% in this country. Yeah. And during the last recession, uh, it reached 10%. Yeah. What I hear is 90% still have a job. Yeah. When Even during the Great Depression, what I hear is 75% still have a job. Yeah. So my strategy has been, if you want to get to people, get them at work, because yeah. that's where they all are. Yeah. And instead of going, knocking, going from door to door, knocking on people's doors saying, hey, can I interest you in a different way of thinking about your life? Yeah. I simply say, let me show you a new way to go to work, whether you're leading the job or being in the job. Yeah. And people go, oh, I need that. I spend more time there than I do at home. Yeah. So for me, it's just a mechanism to get, and as you said, you know, though I talk about organizations and businesses, you can replace the word family in the yeah. word organization and, and the work all makes sense. You yeah. can, you know, unit or team or, or you know, or hospital, yeah. you know, uh, it, it all works yeah. because the ideas are fundamentally about human beings. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, 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 that's very nice of you to say, and, I, and I, that's what I hope. I hope that the, the, I do, the ideas do have uh, breadth yeah. Um, and they do find themselves in places that I did not imagine. Yeah. Um, I think it does. And I think that like, even when you, when you point out like, here's where your just cause lives. Mm. Here's where the finite goals do exist. Mm. Here's how you should think about money. I mean, like I said, you can literally apply that. Number one, it just makes so much sense when you look at it as a whole picture. But you can apply that to your personal finances if you have a job. And sure. you know what I'm saying? You can apply it to, and like you said, marriage, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is. I don't know, man. I think, I mean, obviously you know what you're doing, but but I don't want any of my listeners to think, oh, well, I'm not an entrepreneur, so I don't need to read these books. Cool podcast. Don't need to check it out because, man, there's so much more to it in there than that. And you just get to yeah. hear some, you get to hear it put in a fun, cool context and yeah. hear some good stories about Southwest Airlines and sure. Walmart. It's just, and it's just, they're just stories to communicate an idea. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, no, I think that's true. Um, you, there are, you know, these things are about, they're about human beings. Yeah. I, 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 one thing that you say that I'm not sure I agree with, though, yeah, yeah, tell me. is you said that, you know, we're not religious anymore. You know, mm -hmm. there's the decline in religion. I, I, I think there's a decline in the relevance of the church mm -hmm. or churches. I don't necessarily mean, you know, any particular denomination. Mm -hmm. I think the organizations that are uh, religion mm -hmm. are, have less relevance, but people still want belief. They want yeah. to believe in something. And so they talk about the rise of spirituality and the rise of Buddhism and the rise of mindfulness and the rise of meditation and the rise of all of these things. And people are exploring alternative belief sets, you know, uh, or, or Eastern belief sets over Western belief sets. And, and, and it, it's, it's that we still want to believe in something. Yeah. And we still want to believe that there's a force bigger than us that's, oh, that's taking care sure. of us. You know, everybody's talking about the universe now, you know? Yeah. know? Well, it used to be God, now it's the universe, yeah. right? The, the, the desire to feel connected to something and to each other yeah. is, is as big and as deep as it ever was. Yeah. And unfortunately, the institutions that represent uh, 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 some of the traditional belief sets, i.e. Yeah. religion, they have been unable, and those are human beings, it has yeah. nothing to do with God, yeah. it's the human beings who run the organizations, have been unable to keep their own beliefs relevant in our lives. Yeah. It's an organizational problem, not a religion problem. Yeah. Big time. Religion is not the problem, it's the organization. Correct. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I think that when, when you follow the organization, yeah. and you have a place to go every Sunday, yeah. and they remind you, and you sing songs, it's wonderful. You, you feel this purpose. Like mm -hmm. you, No matter how religious you are or not, you feel this purpose. And I think when people leave that because you're no longer connected, I do think that there's a percentage that have found a, a worthy replacement. 
but I think there's a yeah. lot that feel a lacking. Oh, I completely agree. And I think we see so many things in our in our world today that are 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 encouraging us and even in, incentivizing us to separate from each other, right? Yeah. Like I bought a I got a I got an Xbox, mm-hmm. right? You big gamer? No. <laughs> um uh I got an Xbox mm-hmm. and it came with one controller. Really? That's what they come with. They come with one controller, huh. right? If you want a second controller, you have to buy a second tr- controller. When I was a kid and I had a Nintendo, a Nintendo, it comes with two controllers. Yeah, okay, that's all I remember. Right. Those... Nintendos come with two controllers yeah. when we were kids because the game is basically saying, hey, why don't you play with your friend on the couch on the same TV? And literally Xbox, uh, PlayStation, all of them, they come with one controller. That's interesting. So that you can play alone. One controller right. and an iPhone stand. Right? And and they say, well, you can play with your friends, but my friends aren't sitting on the couch. We're not high-fiving each other. We're just on the phone with each other. Yeah. Right? And 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 try finding a game. I went to... So I went and bought a second controller, and I looked for all the games that I could play with my friends sitting next to me, because yeah. I love the socialness. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with the games, right? You can't even find games that allow you to play sc- split screen. You can only play... Online, so I found one driving game where I could play. Where we could have two drivers on the same screen, right? That's crazy. So, 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 video games. It, it's not the video games that are making us lonely. It's the way that we're told we have to play video games. You, you only get one controller, and you literally cannot buy a game that allows you to play with your friends yeah. in the same room. You cannot, right? So there's that. Then there's our. Then there's the addiction to our cell phones, yeah. which makes us feel lonelier and lonelier. And you see all of these things, to your point, mm-hmm. that are creating distance and separation. We see a rise of depression. We see a rise of anxiety. We see a rise of loneliness. We see a rise of suicide amongst young people in this country, yeah. um, where the rest of the world is seen a decline of suicide. The United States has seen an increase, yeah. right? And um, um, we see all these horrible crimes being perpetrated and mass shootings. Yeah a great number of them are perpetrated by young people, yeah. lonely yeah. people, right? Suicide and mass homicide are basically the same thing. They're, 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 an, they're an act of uh, uh, an attempt to take control when we feel out of control. Yeah. When we feel like helpless and we can't turn to anyone, we attempt to take matters into our own hands yeah. and we do something extremely destructive to ourselves or to others. They're, they're, they're very similar in, in the motivations, yeah. you know? Um, uh, and so I think the problem that we have is is loneliness. And so if spirit, I'm I'm open to any spiritual anything mm-hmm. that that brings us together physically. Yeah. And and even even the way that we Americans are practicing yoga and mindfulness and meditation yeah. is so damn lonely and selfish. Let me give you a perfect <laughs> example. So I I was I was in this meeting mm-hmm. and sitting next to this big timey yoga instructor. Apparently she was a big time yoga instructor. Mm-hmm. And I was sitting next to her at this meeting and the entire time she was on her phone, like under the table. I was sitting right next to her, yeah. right? And I could see, it's not like her grandmother was in hospital and she was getting, you know, updates. Yeah. Like she was on Instagram and like Facebook and she was yeah. just, I don't know what she was doing, right? Yeah. And at one point we were talking about yoga and how yoga helps people. We were talking about being present. We were talking about the importance of being present. Mm-hmm. That's right. And she perked up and she goes, that's why I love yoga. It helps me feel present. I'm like, you've been sitting on your phone this whole time in this meeting. Yeah. You, you, and, and it started to occur to me how we use yoga and mindfulness and meditation because we want to be present. Yeah. The problem is it's become selfish. Yeah. I want to be present. I think we want to look it's, present. It's for me. Yeah. And, and I think, I think w- w- you are not present. We are not present until somebody else says we are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That when, some, when we sit down with our friends and they go, thanks for listening. Congratulations, you're present. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When somebody says to us, I, I really feel you're present with me. Yeah. You're present. When somebody says, I feel heard. Thank you. In a relationship, yeah. when, you're, when your partner says, I really feel heard. Yeah. You are present. Yeah. But if you don't get that feedback, you are not present. Yeah. And the reason to practice meditation is not for yourself. It's for others. Yeah. So you practice meditation. It is a practice. And we learn like when you have a thought and you label it a thought and push it out of your head so you can clear your mind. Yeah. It's so that when you're talking to someone and they're telling you their, they're, they're telling you their feelings, yeah. that you have learned to 
take those thoughts that keep popping in your head, instead of just waiting for your turn to speak, yeah. you've learned to put those thoughts out of your head, bring them back later so that your mind can be filled with their words and their feelings only. Yeah. That's why we practice meditation. Yeah. We practice yoga so we learn how to breathe, we learn how to be there for each other, yeah. right? Yeah. These practices are not selfish, yeah. but we've made them in typical American fashion. Yeah. We've taken these beautiful Eastern things yeah. that are actually about connecting with people yeah. and we've made them all about me, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's my yoga and it's my meditation. Yeah, and I me. think so much of it is- it's terrible. Like, like I said, to look, it's become cool to be present. So now it's become the game, cool to, but you get to declare it, right? I'm I'm present. Yes, I'm currently present. If you haven't seen, I posted three yoga pics last week on right. my Instagram. Do you see how present I've been being? Right. Like it's become how can you be seen as present right. by posting that you meditate? Right. That's and then scrolling while you're in a meeting to see if anyone likes it or not. To see if everybody sees how present I am. Exactly. <laughs> I just love the irony, right? It's such magical irony. It's interesting. I love it. And oh, I, you know, man. there's an entire section in the bookshop called self-help. Yeah. And there is no section in the bookshop called help others. Yeah. And that's what's missing. Where is the help others industry? Yeah. Where, where are the books and the courses and the, to, that, that are encouraging us to do things with each other and for each other? Yeah. Because damn man, I want people to do things with me yeah. and I would love people to do things for me. Yeah. And turns out I have to like the leader, yeah. what makes someone a leader is the one who goes first. Yeah. Doesn't mean you have rank. It just means, you know what? I'm gonna do something for you with no expectation of anything in return. Yeah. Yeah. And um, this is the opportunity. I'm fine with people playing video games, but play them with each other. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm fine with people having phones, but not when we're at dinner with each other. Yeah. Not when we're at a meal with each other. Yeah. You see it all the time, you know, and conversation is a strange thing. Conversation, it, it's kind of like a car. It takes time to warm up, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? So you, you go out for dinner with a friend, even if you don't have any phones on the table, and the conversation is sort of nonsense at the beginning. It's like, oh, it's like, it's like superficial. Yeah. But, but as the dinner goes, it gets deeper and deeper and better and better. Yeah. But the problem is every time somebody picks up their phone, it resets. Yeah. It's like turning off your car and leaving it for the night. Yeah. You have to warm it up again. Yeah. And so you see people, they talk for a little bit, and then they put their phones up and they're talking, but it's, super, it's still superficial. Yeah. There's no depth. Yeah. And so that's why we don't feel connected with each other anymore. We struggle to feel connected, I should say, yeah. is because even the conversations, when we have them, we don't allow them the time and the space to go deep. Yeah. You know, I, when I go out for dinner with friends, I give my phone to the person I'm with. So I literally don't have it. Yeah. So I, I have to go to the bathroom without my phone because yeah. <laughs> I don't have my phone, yeah. Yeah. you know? Yeah. And we'd all do it. You, As you're walking to the bathroom, we're pulling our phones out and the person who's left at the table, yeah. God forbid they should be by themselves for five minutes, the phone comes out. Yep. We don't sit back and just take, give your, trade phones. Don't just put them in the middle of the table. Give away your phones. Yeah, that's a good idea. Right? And then when you're done at the end of the night, everybody gets their phone back. So you can get your Uber, you can go home. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and and it's, again, it's like, it's the analogy going back to the beginning. It's the chocolate cake. We want the, we want the dopamine yeah. hit. It yeah. feels so good, that phone, every time we get something. Yeah. But I urge you to eat more vegetables, which just means being with your friends. And sometimes it's a little boring and sometimes you just stare at each other. Yeah. But if you just keep doing it, yeah. you start to get healthier yeah. and feel better and feel connected and the conversations get deeper and the friendships get deeper and the trust gets deeper. Yeah. And, we, and unfortunately, all of these things that we're talking about take work. Yeah. That's the problem. Like, you don't get to take a pill and get into shape. Yeah. Like, you unfortunately, you have to go to the gym. And even if you hit all your fitness goals, you still have to keep going to the gym for the yeah. rest of your life. Yeah. And what we're talking about with this infinite game is much more of a lifestyle yeah. than it is an event or a practice. It's a practice. Yeah. It's, not a, it's not something you, you do once. Yeah. It's something you, you learn to live, you know? You don't just go to a yoga class. Yeah. You know, you, you know, you, you go to, you, 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 you're all mindful and go to yoga class and then somebody cuts you off on the highway and you start <laughs> yeah. giving them the, well, that's not very mindful of you, is it? No. Nope. You can also just go, sorry. Yeah. And it's all good. Even yeah. if you didn't do anything wrong. So what? Yeah. As soon as you say, sorry, you know, it's over. Yeah. There's a wonderful story of two monks. Mm -hmm. uh, two monks are, are traveling and they come up to a, a, a river, a stream, and there's an old lady standing there and she looks at them with wanting eyes and the... The old monk, there's an old monk and a young monk. And the old monk says, you know, come with me. And he carries her across the, the stream. And they get to the other side. He puts her down and she just walks away. You know? 
and the two monks keep walking. And three, four miles later, the young monk says, I, 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 weren't you angry? You carried her across the stream and she didn't even say thank you. Yeah. And the old monk looks at him and says, I only carried her across the stream. You've been carrying her ever since. <laughs> Good. Right? Yeah, we, and so yep. you think about it like somebody cuts you off and we literally are still talking about it like yeah. a mile down the street. So true. Like just say sorry and it lasted a second. Yeah. Like that's mindfulness. Yeah. It's not, not like, getting Instagram pissed story. off on my way to my yoga <laughs> class and then getting pissed <laughs> off my way back. Like that's, that's yeah. us. Like that's, that's who we are these days. Yeah. And I think, I think our nation needs to hold up a mirror and say, ah, I could probably do a little better. Yeah. You know? I agree. Okay, that's a perfect place. I got to let you get going. I have two big ender questions, but I just want to say, man, I'm so happy with how this conversation went and like the fact that it went there. Because when I read your books, once again, I'll say it again, I just felt like, man, this is more than business. This will help a lot of people. And... I didn't know if when I brought it up, if you'd be like, oh yeah, I guess so. Or if, you, but you can tell there's so much more to it than that. And there's so much more to your mission than that. And so thank you for everything that you're doing and thank for, you. you know, hiding it so well. You know, you snuck <laughs> it in there. Yeah. Last one is if you could prescribe anything to the entire world for 30 days and they have to do it, what would you tell everyone to do? Uh, like two things popped in my head. Am I allowed to say two? Yeah, you can say two. So one is super easy, which is to 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 really find the right balance for the telephone. Yeah. You know, um, you know, alcohol is fun. Too much alcohol is bad. Mm -hmm. You know, gambling is fun. Gambling away, you know, your, your college education money, not a good idea. Yeah. And the phones are the same. Our phones are fine. There's nothing wrong with them. But sleep with it in a different room. Put it in a different room when you're when you're in bed. So when you wake up in the middle of the night, you don't check your phone. Like just. You'll sleep better. I trust me. Yeah. Uh, when you go out with your friends, er, everybody hand your phone to someone else. For the, from the minute you you say hi to each other to the minute you say good night, yeah. you know. Um, and oh, and put the airplane in terror. Put the the plane. Put the phone in airplane mode when you do, because that way yeah. it never buzzes. It never beeps, yeah. and you don't have that weird feeling that something's coming in. Yeah. So I put my phone in airplane mode and give it to my friend. Do that. Yeah. It works. Um, so that's one massive prescription I would offer. And the other one is every time you see the opportunity to take care of someone that you love, do that. Yeah. Simon, I can't thank you enough, man. This was great. From the first book I ever read to the podcast, man, this has been a full circle moment for me. Well, thank you very much for having me and thank you for giving me a, a platform to, to share. I appreciate it. Thank you for everything you do. Guys, if you like that and you want to see more like it as well as vlogs, other web series and all the random stuff that I'm doing here on YouTube, don't forget to click that subscribe button. You won't regret it. I promise.